We are in the book of Luke this morning. Surprise, surprise. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22. This is the sixth week that we have spent just on this one night. But oh, what a night it was. It was that night that Jesus went to the upper room with his boys. That night of the famous Last Supper. That night when he said, someone is going to betray me and they are here in this room. It was that night that he left and walked out into the garden and that is where we left him last week. I can't help but wonder if it isn't just part of the strategy of Jesus. He knows he's going to be betrayed. And if Judas brings the Roman guards to that upper room in a crowded, packed city, well, there will be riots. There will be bloodshed. There will be a massacre. And I believe that's one of the main reasons why Jesus leaves the upper room and he goes down the stairs out into the night and goes to the garden. I believe that is the reason why he goes to a quiet place. He knows the cross is about him, no one else. And last week we looked at the simplicity, the honesty, the openness of that prayer. Nobody, nobody ever told me when I was growing up as a child in church, nobody ever told me that Jesus did not want to die for me. Even still today, it sounds, it sounds kind of weird to say that in church. I don't know what I thought. Maybe, maybe I thought Jesus had sort of skipped on down to the cross and jumped up and like, ta-da, here I am. Maybe that's what I thought. Nobody ever told me, oh no, he begged three times not to die for you. But in an overwhelming act of love, God the Father said, thanks for your honesty, son, but there is no other way. And although he begged not to, God said, this is the only way salvation comes to Bill. And in that garden scene, Jesus begged, Father, is there any other way to save our friends, to save our family, to save our neighbors? And as Jesus is wrestling with that prayer, the answer comes immediately. This is not an arrest. This is murder. This will not be done publicly. This will not be done in open courts. This will not be done with justice. This will be done quietly in the darkness, away from the crowds. Your Bible, like mine, may have a little title right above verse 47 that says the arrest of Jesus. I have scribbled that out and written the murder of Jesus because that's what this is. In my Bible, that's not a trial going on. This is a sham. And we're going to see that today in our passage beginning in verse 47. We're in Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and a man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And I have always wondered why a kiss. We have to remember that it's dark and they don't have street lights in the Garden of Gethsemane. There are so many people in that town of Jerusalem that have travelers that have swarmed to the town to celebrate Passover. I have no doubt there were people probably in that garden camping or sleeping nearby. And Judas is going to bring the chief priests and he's going to bring the temple guards, heavily armed Roman soldiers. And you would think as they got closer, Judas would simply point and say, there's your guy, go get him. But no, Judas says, you know what? We have this thing that we do to our rabbi. I'm going to walk up and I'm going to kiss him on the cheek. That's your guy. 
and in the darkness with armed guards behind him. He walks up to Jesus and kisses him. And Jesus is like, really? Really, Judas, you're going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss. You're going to pretend to be affectionate while at the same time going against my will and setting me up. Nice job, Judas. We talked about Judas before, but once again we see the audacity, we see the arrogance of this man. And there are some things we can learn from this passage. And the first one is simply this. Being close to Jesus doesn't mean you're close to Jesus. It has been three years. He was there with Jesus. He always got to ride in the boat. He always got to walk with him. He, every night, he always got to eat with him. Every morning, they would sit around the campfire and just talk. For three years, he was the closest to Jesus, and yet we find out he was never at all close to Jesus. Oh, my friends, you can be around the things of God without ever being a person of God. Just because you have a position, just because you go to church, just because you say a prayer, it does not ensure your faithfulness. Think of the life of Judas. He has been under great teaching. He has a mentor who walks on water. He's in full-time ministry. He's got a Christian resume that could out-resume any of us. Who discipled you? Jesus Christ. Well, what were your studies? Well, I majored in miracles. I, I even performed a couple of them myself. Have you ever been exposed to, to, to any decent teaching? Well, yeah, I sat at the Sermon of the Mount. You ever been in ministry? Yeah, full time, three years. What was your position? I was treasurer at Jesus Christ Ministries. The Jesus Christ Ministries? Yeah, that one. Judas had a resume far better than any of ours. And yet we find out in the book of John that Judas has two big problems. First of all, he has a problem with money. He's always saying, what's in it for me? Judas is someone that would come and sit in church, and or even on a regular basis, and he would always be thinking in the back of his mind, when is this going to pay off? What's in it for me? When is, when is the magic genie going to score for my wallet? And Scripture tells us that he would regularly help himself to the money bags of the disciples. And the other problem Judas has is he doesn't like the way and the direction that Jesus is going. You see, for Judas, like so many in Israel, the Messiah was to be a conquering king. The Messiah is going to be a redeemer that will make this life better, that will free them from the Roman oppressions. That's the Messiah they're looking for. And that includes Judas. And for the last year, Jesus has been talking about dying and going to a cross. Judas was all about following a Jesus that was going to eliminate Roman oppression, bring a kingdom, bring power, bring safety, bring freedom. And Judas has finally gotten to the point where he's had enough. And he decides to take matters into his own hands. And he makes a deal with the Pharisees. Which brings us to point number two. Obedience will cost. Obedience will cost you. You see, the only way that you can ever know your degree of obedience, your faithfulness, your, your Christianity, it's only determined in what it costs you. And usually it has to be something big. When obedience is something you don't want to do, that's where you're going to find your faithfulness. It's those areas of life where you say, I've got to change my sexuality. It's those areas of life you say, I've got to change my living conditions, who I'm staying with. 
It's those areas of life where you have to change. How do you love your enemies? Those things that you want to do? Oh, no. That's not a test of your obedience. Your obedience is going to be determined by doing the things you don't want to do. In all of my years of being a parent, I have never once had to tell my children, you must sit down and eat the rest of that ice cream. I've never once had to say that. As an adult, nobody ever one time has had to tell me, Bill, you must lay down and take a nap this afternoon. Nobody's ever had to tell me that. You see, obedience isn't found in the things you want to do. Obedience is found in the things you don't want to do. It's the areas of our life that we hold back and we say, I don't like God's direction on this. And we see Judas who has the right resume, and, and yet we find a guy who's willing to betray a very close friend for 30 pieces of silver. Friends, faithfulness always has been and always will be about obedience. My hope, my prayer for this church is that we never become a people that are around the things of God and fail to become people of God. All right, let's go back to this story. Pick it up in verse 49. Verse 49. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. They didn't even wait for an answer. It's like, Lord, should we do this? <laughs> oh, Oops. It's like that little kid that comes up with chocolate icing all over his face and he says, Mom, can I have a cupcake? You might have wanted to ask beforehand. John chapter 18 will tell us which one of the disciples did this. And of course, we know it's Peter. Verse 51. But Jesus answered no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Now, I gotta ask, how does the story not end right there? I, 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 how is the guard not going, oh man, this guy might be the son of God, I'm out of here. Does Jesus like reach down and pick up the ear out of the dirt and <laughs> kind of blow it off a little bit, stick it on? How are the rest of the guards not going, this is like, we're not doing this. And I love that the disciples can't fight. I love that an ex-fisherman takes out his sword, and because he's a fisherman, not a, not a soldier, he doesn't know what to do with a sword, so he casts it like he would a fishing pole, and he catches just an ear. And I love that Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter. Jesus doesn't chastise him. He simply says, no, no. This is, this is no more of this. It's as if Jesus is saying, I'm going to take the cross, guys. If I get a bunch of ex-fishermen that are going to try to go up against heavily armed Roman guards, it's not going to end well. And we're all going to die right here in this garden. I think it's the strategy of Jesus simply saying, guys, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to take it. You take the story. I'll take the cross. You take the story and run with it. And the disciples scatter. And over the next few days, Jesus is going to endure beating and he's going to endure the pain of the crucifixion. But I truly think one of the gravest, one of the deepest wounds isn't inflicted by whips or nails. I think the deepest wound is inflicted by Judas, one of his own, one of his friends. It's the betrayal that came from within. It was one of my boys, one of the 12. It was the one I was closest to, the one I trusted completely. Have you ever noticed that about betrayal? It's point three on your outline. Those that we trust the most Oh, they can hurt us deeply. They can hurt us the most. Those that we trust the most can hurt us the most. 
It's that man or that woman that stood in front of you and said, till richer or for richer or poorer, till death do us part, and you find out later they didn't mean it. What they really meant was, I'm going to give it a try until times get hard, and then it's going to be all about me. It's those that God has given the position to protect us, to train us, to equip us, to raise us, the position of mom and dad, the ones who bring us into the world, those who are supposed to give us life and give us structure for growing to be the men and women that God has us to be. And yet there is incredible hurt when they betray us. And decades later, we may still be walking around with those scars and that pain. It's those closest friends, those business partners that you trusted implicitly. Those closest to us that can hurt us the most. And for Jesus, it comes from one of his own. It doesn't come from the enemies outside. It doesn't come from Rome. It doesn't come from the temple. It comes from within. Let's pick up in verse 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have to come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. I love that title, when darkness reigns. I love where Jesus goes with this. He's like, really? You're coming at me with armed guards? Every day you saw me. Every day I was in the temple teaching. Every day you knew who I was and what I was about. And and this is done under the cover of darkness? Really? This isn't an arrest. This is murder. It is his strategy. It is his obedience. It is his love for you and for me that he says, I'll take the cross, guys. You take the story. Jesus, the Son of God, betrayed by a friend. Oh, and that hurts. It was someone they trusted. And as bad as it is to be betrayed by a friend, I want to look at another story in our Bible about betrayal, but this time it isn't a friend, it's family. Oh, it hits home. And to do that, you need to flip all the way back to the front of your book, back to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, I think we're going to start about verse 46. And for those of you who might be dealing with betrayal, this is a must read for you guys. It's 12 chapters, so we're not going to read it all this morning. But I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of what's happened in the life of a young man named Joseph. It's a story about a family who violates the ultimate trust and betrays. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers, and and after a run-in with a rich man's wife, Joseph is accused of rape. And if you're a slave and a wealthy man's wife says that you raped her, you have no defense. And you go to jail. And Joseph winds up in prison. But Joseph has the ability to interpret dreams. And, and the Pharaoh is having some really freaky, weird dreams. And so finally they come and they clean Joseph up and they take him to the Pharaoh. And he interprets the dreams. He says, Pharaoh, what your dreams mean is that there's going to be seven good years of crops. Bountiful harvest. Store up. Because your dreams also mean that there's going to be seven bad years of famine. And you need that storage from those seven good years to be able to make it through the seven bad years. And Pharaoh says, you know, no one else has been able to tell me this. Would you consider being my number two in charge of everything in the entire country, second only to me? And Joseph says, well, let's see. I'm in prison. I'm I'm, I'm a good prisoner or number two in the country. I, I think I'll take that. It's a good job. So let's pick up the story in verse 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. 
Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, the daughter of Potipharia, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God made me forget all my trouble and my father's household. And the second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Clearly we see there are two things that are core, central, foundational to, jo to Joseph. They are, so, they are so much ingrained into him that when he has sons, he will name them, one, who he is, and two, what he has become. He does not give them Egyptian names. He gives them Hebrew names. He says, my firstborn is going to be called Manasseh because God has allowed me to forget what my family has done to me. He's allowed that pain to go away. It's not that he forgot what happened. That word Manasseh actually means let go and forgive. And he says, that's what God's done for me. I've been able to let go. I've been able to forgive. I've been able to move my life beyond where I was to where I am. And put it behind me. Oh, there were times when I was a slave. Man, that hatred burned deep. There were times when I was, a, when I was working for Potiphar when, when, when I raged against my brothers. And I don't know how long it took for him. But he found forgiveness. And he was able to get through. It's so core. It's so elemental to him and who he is that when his son is born, he's like, you are going to be called forgiveness because that's what I've been filled with. And when the second son is born, he says, you will be called fruitfulness because that's what God has made me in this land that I live. And did you catch what he said there? He says, in the land of my suffering. God made him fruitful in the land of my suffering. God never took him out of his suffering. God never made it so he would go back home to his parents and his brothers. God never took him out of Egypt, but he was made fruitful right where he was. And the two things that are at the very core of Joseph, he passes on to his sons, forgiveness and fruitfulness. And that is why in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph can say to his brothers, what you intended for harm, God used for good to accomplish what is now being done in saving many lives. I love the parallels of these two stories, Joseph and Jesus. Joseph is sold into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus got a little bit better deal. He went for 30. Joseph was sold by his own family. Jesus by his spiritual family, the one closest to him. Joseph says, I don't want to be a slave. And I don't want to live in a dungeon, but if that's where God has me, I'm going to be the very best that I can. Jesus goes to the garden and says, I don't want to do this. If there's any other way, Father, take it from me. But in obedience, he says, not my will, but yours. How do we handle betrayal? What do you do when it happens to you? Oh, it hurts. It hurts bad, especially when it's someone close to you. But may I remind you that the pain you feel, even all these years later, it may have been five or 10 or 20 or longer years ago. The pain is still fresh in you. But may I remind you, the one losing sleep over it is you, not them. It may have happened a long time ago and it's still killing you. It still tears you apart. And meanwhile, they sleep peacefully. I'm not saying you should forget it. I'm not, I'm not saying that you, you just need to put it out of your mind. I am saying that at some point you need to simply say, God, it is yours. I give it to you. 
because I don't want it anymore. I'm not saying there shouldn't be justice. I'm saying let God be the judge and the jury. And next week we're going to continue and look at Luke's writing and we're going to look at how to deal with injustice, how to deal with betrayal even more. But for today, I simply want you to remember this. Let God, let God be the judge and the jury. The person that's betrayed you, yeah, they deserve punishment. Oh, yeah. But let me ask you this. Who's better at handing out punishment, you or God? Oh, people, there, there are people in my life that have betrayed me. Some of my, some of my favorite prayers come from David. God, my enemies are your enemies. Take care of them. But I would like to give you a few bullet points on what I'd like to see you do. Just kidding. The pain of betrayal can cripple you. The pain of betrayal can fester inside of you and prevent you from being the person of God that he's called you to be. There has to come a point when you simply say, God, it's yours. I don't want it anymore. I want to be the one that sleeps at night. And I want to be the one in obedience that trusts you completely. My prayer is that that's each of what we say, each of us. Let's pray. Father, thanks for who you are and what you've done for us and the way you love us. And Father, for those of us who are still struggling with betrayal and, and the pain, I pray that they would walk through this with you, that in their Egypt, in their pain, Father, let them never lose sight of the simple fact that they are still your son or daughter. Show them your grace. Show them your forgiveness. God, may we surrender the pain and the hurt simply to you and say, it is not, it is no longer a part of my life. And Father, we pray that you'll restore joy to those who are hurting today because the pain is still so intense inside of us. Father, give us the strength to do the right thing even when the wrong thing seems so easy and so right. And Father, we pray this in your Son's precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you for coming this morning. Please come back next Sunday. In the meantime, if you're suffering from betrayal this week, I simply encourage you to go out there and give it to God. Just simply say, it's yours. Let him bless you. Amen. God be with you till we meet.